Hello and welcome back. Eddie Radosovich, George Stoy here from the Suterscoop.com studios on Campus Corner. Yeah? How about that? Got a TV in the uh, studio now, George. That's actually my TV. I uh, let Carrie Murdoch b borrow it yeah, for the studio. We have run out of TVs in Suter Scoop offices and uh, have now required George to go TV-less. Uh, actually, one of your punishments. Part of my suspension. You're part of your suspension. Well, the suspension the, is uh, over. Unofficial 40. Yes. Welcome back. Thank you. All the, was, uh, uh, all the car situation. Car situations are never the worst. We were both driving down here on uh, we Wednesday. were racing some would say we were, we were racing some would on the say it, it was kind of like the uh what's the reality television show that follows the uh people around Oklahoma City over on the south side and they I don't watch race. reality tv at all nope you've never watched reality television never not once that right here maybe love is island a dis that's that's <laughs> upsetting this is the difference between just a few years because I grew up in the generation of real world road rules mm -hmm. mtv and you didn't have that. Yeah, you left me in like. the dust. Uh, you and your Lexus left me in the dust. My car died uh, on the highway. It I had was, to get a new it, alternator. It was like scary because I, I looked back at one point. And I was like, hmm. Yeah. Where did George go? Yeah, I was off, you off to the me. side. So I, uh, I kind of got scared, though, when you did call because I was like, I hope we didn't get a wreck behind me or something. Yeah, no, that would have been really bad. It would have been your fault, too, because you were you were speeding. That's not factual at all. I don't ever speed. I am a man of... Uh, Great restraint when it comes to uh, mm -hmm. the roadways. I've I've been in your passenger seat enough times, to and know I that's make not you true. buckle up for a reason. Oklahoma coming back to Norman this Saturday, taking on West Virginia, George, a West Virginia team that's six and three, four and two in conference play. They're you know probably one of their losses this season is a game that everybody watched on a Thursday night down in Houston. Uh, that ended in a Hail Mary for the Houston Cougars uh, to, to win that game. Penn State, Oklahoma State. Uh, Penn State, I believe, was in Happy Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the first weeks of the year. Might have been the opening weekend I of think the it year, was, if I yeah. remember correctly. And then uh, James Franklin ran up the score on him in the fourth quarter, much to, uh, I'm sure, the pleasure of the Nittany Lion fans. And then uh, Oklahoma State, a couple weeks ago up in Morgantown. This is a really good football team. They've exceeded expectations. Uh, you know, picked last in the Big 12, uh, a group that – a lot of people didn't expect to get to a bowl game. They're already there. They're at six wins. Uh, they're playing really sound football. They got a lot of guys from the transfer portal. Uh, Garrett Green's been playing really well uh, at quarterback for them. Uh, you know, and this is a team that let's remember uh, beat Oklahoma a year ago, and, and they weren't very good a year ago. Uh, and I'm sure that that is a, a little bit of fuel to the fire for Oklahoma, but. You're right. This is a West Virginia team playing really well. I think the sixth best rushing offense in the country right now, so they can really run the football. We get into that a little bit later with Gabe Eichert, our special guest for the show this week. But uh, this is a good football team, and I know a lot of Oklahoma fans uh, are, are you know, struggling with what's happened the last two weeks. Well, it does not get any easier this Saturday. No doubt about it. And people forget, I almost died last year in Morgantown. Oklahoma's first loss to West Virginia. They have won 9 of 10 against the uh, Mountaineer program since they joined the Big 12. I had forgotten just the disparity in the game. I mean, Oklahoma, it was another game, and not to rehash everything, but they dominated the football game. In fact, it was reminded me of the in the Oklahoma game notes this week. Oklahoma averaged 6.3 yards per play to West Virginia's 4.7 and registered two turnovers yep. to none uh, without committing a turnover. And then uh, West Virginia finds a way to kick a 25-yard field goal with no time remaining. One of the many losses, one of the many uh, you know, one-possession losses in that 2-7 and seven record that we talked about on the Eskridge Lexus postgame show up in Stillwater, as well as back here on Tuesday's practice report for a little bit more on the Mountaineers, here is Brent Vittables with just a little bit of an overview of what to expect from Neil Barron's program. It's a dual, true th dual threat quarterback. Probably the strength of their team, as they will tell you, is their offensive line. Got great experience there. They did a great job in the, in the transfer portal, uh, bringing in some additional receivers and tight ends. Tight ends, they get the ball to uh, quite a bit. And uh, defensively playing uh, uh, really well. Play with a lot of confidence, play with great effort. Got a good experience group back there and super uh, efficient in the in the special team. So uh, going to be, again, uh, a really uh, good opportunity for us. Uh, you know, we're going to have to play well and uh, we're going to have to certainly play uh, complimentary football and uh, clean football, taking care of the ball, uh, being able to be efficient, you know, in all three phases. 
Oklahoma went one for 13 combined on third and fourth downs a year ago up in Morgantown. Not good. Not great, Bob. Uh, as far as kind of big picture wise, Oklahoma coming in here, they're in a little bit of a skid, having lost two games in a row in Lawrence in Stillwater. I think everybody, George, uh, doesn't probably need to relive everything. There's uh, It kind of boils down to a number of things, of which we talk about with Gabe Eichert here shortly, but uh, penalties, just overall discipline, taking care of the football, not giving it away uh, like they have here over the course of this two-game losing streak. Is that kind of what is centralized for you as far as what needs to happen moving forward to not really turn this into a disaster and lose three in a row. Yeah, we've said it a lot this week. It's been Oklahoma beating themselves. It's not so much the opponent. And, and give Kansas and, Kansas and Oklahoma State credit. Those are sure. two fundamentally sound football teams. But a, a large part of the reason why Oklahoma's lost is you look at the turnover margin. Uh, you know, I think in the first seven games, Oklahoma only turned the ball over five times. In the last two games, they turned it over six uh, that's not going to win you many football games. Uh, defensively, I think they've played well enough to win, but you also give up the two long drives. You have some costly penalties, whether they're questionable or not. It doesn't matter. They happened. Uh, and then I think, you know, we all know what's going on with the offense in terms of just too many self-inflicted wounds and, and, and mistakes that, um, you know, can't happen. You mentioned the pre-snap penalties. Uh, you had several last week. Uh, you mentioned the turnovers. All those things, you have to cut those out. And when you play teams like an Oklahoma State and a Kansas, they'll make you pay. And West Virginia is in that same category of a team that Oklahoma should beat. But if Oklahoma goes out and plays like they did the last two weeks or even the last three weeks when you think back to the UCF game, they'll get beat on Saturday. It'll be a close game down the stretch. Unfortunately for this program, navigating some low points has been a little bit of a theme here over the first you know year in nine games, if you will, through the Brent Venables era. He was asked on Tuesday as well as players on Monday night about navigating this two-game losing streak. I said we still believe who we are. Uh, we still believe that our goals are tangible, and uh, we're leaning in on each other. It's a real brotherhood. There's really no negativity in the locker room, and uh, everybody's looking up and motivated and working really hard. Our leaders are stepping up and being really vocal, so it's really awesome seeing how we're coming together. How have you felt the team has responded so far? Uh, I don't know yet. I, I think we'll know uh, come Saturday. That'll be a, a big deciding factor how we respond. So, how, how much of that is on your shoulders as a leader on this team? It's it's a part of it. You know, it's on it's on my shoulders. It's on everyone's shoulders. But you know, me being in a, the leadership position, but also playing quarterback for for these guys, it's uh, it's what I signed up for. So, not shying away from it. Um, I was prepared for it, not necessarily, you know, those two, but um, just in general, you know, all that comes with it. So um, that's what I signed up for, and I love these guys. So, you know, you got to get back to work. Yeah, I mean, it's just detail and execution, and then doing your 111th uh, play, like doing your job and focusing on just your job and dominating your job and focus on the little details, not uh, putting ourselves behind the sticks, having pre snap penalties. That's a focus thing, that's something you can control. Um, not, you know, say losing a snap, that's something you can control. I mean, if a guy makes a play on the other side, that's great. But, I mean, stuff that not letting Oklahoma beat Oklahoma, really. And so that's pre-snap penalties. That's, you know, I don't know as much about defense, but, you know, being, being lined up in the right place, guarding the right guy, not busting, and the same thing on offense. You know, that's that's any team. You know, you have a really good week of practice, and you go out to game and doesn't show up. You know, you, you get frustrated, and it could, it could link to so many things. But every team faces that. But uh, we've been practicing really hard, and we've been, we, we've repped everything. Uh, that we're going to see in the game. So when it comes time to show up in the game, we just got to apply it. You know, we've already we've already been through the fire. We're already refined. Let's go. And uh, just it comes with belief, more leadership, more confidence on the field, playing faster. You know, that that comes with reps and practice and all that. So uh, just keep it, keep on chopping wood. You know, even when it's not going our way, that's life. Uh, keep on going. That's that's our attitude right now. Yeah. Again, it just it starts with me. Again, attitude, um, accountability, uh, ownership. Uh, motivation, uh, how you teach and how you correct uh, to get the guys have the right perspective. Again, I mean, this when you're in this sport, you know, handling both success and failure and everything in between is is important. You know, again, your mindset, your attitude, uh, your perspective. Uh, perspective drives everything, and so having the right perspective, again, 
you know, it's okay. You should be disappointed. You've invested a lot. You didn't get the result that you wanted, but it's not a, you know, it's not a failure. Uh, uh, some people agree with that. Some people won't. That's fine. You know, that's uh, everybody's uh, prerogative. But uh, again, it's got to be eyes forward. You know, uh, you know, you can't sit there and look in the rearview mirror and uh, put the car in a ditch. You got to, you know, eyes forward. And you know, again, uh, what we got to do in front of us. You know, where where we got to correct, where we got to get better. You know, uh, whether that's uh, schemes or it's fundamentals or. Uh, it's new players getting added to to the mix. Uh, it's the matchups, you know, for the next opponent. All those things. Agonizingly close. That and I. It's not to like quote Lincoln Riley or anything like that. It, they are close, without being close. It seems like that, if that even makes any sense. It it does uh, in some ways. I, I think that <laughs> it's weird. It yeah. really is weird because, I mean, we and we talked about this on Tuesday. You look at the offensive numbers. You would think that this team in the way that, like, I think I can't remember if I said this maybe on the podcast, on the unofficial 40 this week, George. It feels like if you just looked at the way that Oklahoma's played defensively even in the fourth quarter of games and the numbers of, uh, you know, turnovers, whether it be the one last week or the two the week before, and especially if you look at the time, you would have thought, how many games, how many, or how many uh, touchdowns did you win by? They've lost both of them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a couple plays here and there, right? It, that's what it feels like. I, I, it, I don't want to make it sound simple, but in a lot of ways it is. It's, you know, not turning the ball over with a couple bad snaps. It's uh, not throwing into double coverage. It's not having a defensive lineman catch a, a kick a kickoff, right? Uh, it's the little things. And, and again, I think for the most part, Oklahoma's playing well at times, and then it, they go on a stretch where they're not. Um, and I know I kind of dove into the numbers. We'll get into that story later. But sure. I think that that's what it boils down to is it's it's not just one thing. It's a lot of things, and it's things going bad at the absolute worst times. <laughs> like, and, that's what and, it is. And, and you're talking about, like, when it goes bad. It goes really it bad. It goes really bad in maybe the most critical points of a yeah. game here over the last two weeks and maybe even the last three weeks if you want to throw in the Central Florida game outside of, uh, you know, the Kendall Dolby fourth down or the stop on two the point two-point conversion. Point conversion. Yeah. So, it's been rough. Uh, for this week's opponent preview interview, we sat down with our good friend, Gabe Eichard. You probably, I'm sure you're familiar with him, but Sirius XM uh, Big 12 Today radio host, as well as the host alongside Teddy Lehman on the Oklahoma Breakdown. And you can hear him on Saturday on the Oklahoma radio broadcast. Here's our discussion with Gabe. Welcome in, Gabe. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, I think, as you said before we got started, there's not much to talk about. Uh, Oklahoma, obviously, the last two weeks has been, it's been rough. It's been, a, it's been very rough. Uh, you know, for me, I, I obviously, they didn't get the benefit of uh, some calls in Stillwater. Uh, for me, it kind of uh, underscores just how poorly they've played. And for you, I guess, just over the last two weeks, turnovers and penalties, that seems to be the two biggest issues right now. Yeah, I I would I would lump in, you know, with turnovers and penalties just a lack of complimentary football at the most important times in the football game. <laughs> you think about the Kansas game. They Ethan Downs gets the interception. You need one first down and the game's over. One. And unfortunately the offense wasn't able to get the job done. Uh, you think about the third quarter. I've thought about the sequence in the third quarter a lot in Bedlam. The defense is playing well, getting stops, turnover on downs, the interception for Billy Bowman, and that entire sequence, OU's offense gets seven points out of it. The opportunities have been there, but the offense just hasn't held up their end of the bargain when this team has needed them to. And you throw the turnovers, the penalties on top of all of that. And that's how you lose two football games that I believe they should have won. Right. With the way that the defense played in both of them, I, I thought the defense played well enough to win in Lawrence and in Stillwater. And unfortunately, the offense just hasn't been able to put it together when they've needed it most. 
it's cra- It's interesting to me too that it seems like, and for the just the the person out there like me that just watches the game and you see them look so good at times, and then it just seems like it hits a speed bump and they get off track, they get off schedule, whether it be a penalty, whether it be a go from a, a, a false start and go from a second and five to all of a sudden they're second and ten. It just seems like it comes to a stop from what you've seen over the last two weeks. Is there a key characteristic that makes this thing come to a, a screeching halt, it seems, offensively? Well, certainly the penalties matter, right? When you talk about getting behind the chains, uh, those penalties, it just changed the it changes the way you have to call the game. From a play calling perspective, it but it puts you in bad spots. But the thing that the thing that has stood out the most is in these last two games. I mean, the argument argument could be made that OU's run the football as well as they've run it all season long. Especially when you factor in the opponent, just Dylan Gabriel has not been sharp. He was he was so good at times early in the season. And I thought he was at his best when he was aggressive. Like you go back and you think about the Iowa state game and the way that he played in that game and some of the things he did pushing the ball down the field. And I know the weather was a factor in Lawrence, but we saw very little of that. Right. And I I know there was a, a conversation to be had about the play calling in that one and factoring in the conditions. I get that. But Dylan Gabriel was not sharp in that game, right? The pick six is just a throw that that's the type of throw and the type of decision we haven't seen him make this season, but he made it in that game. And that was a huge critical error in that football game. And then in Stillwater, he he did some good things. There's no doubt, but the deep ball, the lack of effectiveness in the deep ball for him I mean, it shows up over and over again. I mean, Farouk, Farouk by no means is a burner, yeah. right? He can run, don't get me wrong, but he's under throwing Jalil Farouk, and Farouk's got the guys from Oklahoma State beat. I mean, they're beat. And they just weren't able to capitalize on that opportunities. He's just been a little off. And this offense, while there's talent, there's no doubt they're not talented enough offensively to miss those type of plays and to make some of the mistakes they've made. I mean, the, what I call giveaways, there's takeaways and giveaways, right? When the defense earns it, it's a takeaway. When you just hand them the damn football, it's a giveaway. And there's just been entirely too many giveaways these last two weeks and that that's that's what gets you beat Gabe uh there's been a lot of criticism of of the play calling you mentioned the play calling Jeff Lebby's uh gotten a lot of scrutiny I'm not going to ask you if the play calling should be better but I what I am going to ask you is let's say you're hired as the offensive coordinator tomorrow how would you go about calling plays or fixing this offense I am putting you on the spot here but uh, how would you Uh, fix it First of all, uh, coaching is on the list of what my wife has labeled divorceable offenses. <laughs> so that that ain't happening, boys. But I I am an outside zone guy. I think it's the best play in football. And you're going to see West Virginia coming to Norman this weekend. You're going to see a team that runs outside zone very well. And they come off the ball with velocity at the offensive line position and they get downhill with their running game. So the first thing I would do would be establish outside zone. And I, I'm a huge believer in what you can do off of it, right? Your extended play action stuff, your move the pocket stuff, your boot game. And once again, you'll see that type of stuff from West Virginia. You saw some of that stuff from Kansas. You see it from some of the best offenses in the NFL. Oh, you really doesn't do any of that. So that would be the first thing I would change. But I I think the RPO stuff, it it, it takes advantage of the rules in college. With With the offensive lineman being allowed to go down the field three yards, you can't do that in the NFL. right? That's why you don't see a lot of this stuff in the NFL. But I thought there was a good contrast of 
RPO philosophy in Bedlam. You see OU's RPO stuff. It's a lot of, hey, behind the line of scrimmage. At or behind the line of scrimmage. Whether it be the bubbles, whether it be the quicks to the outside. We've seen some of that speed out stuff that it's caught, you know, one or two yards. Meanwhile, Oklahoma State was running their RPO stuff. And they're they're throwing it down the field when they're getting when they're feeling like they have a numbers advantage on the outside. I mean, how many a bunch of those Rashad Owens catches, those are all RPOs. Yeah. Right? Alan Bowman likes the matchup outside and they throw it down the field, not at the line of scrimmage. So that would be a RPO stuff. There's a reason so many teams do it. It's because you're taking advantage of the rules. And I would like to see more throws down the field, right? When they don't like the box count, they don't hand the run game. I, I'd like to see them be more aggressive pushing it down the field as opposed to the pass option in the RPO being all the stuff at the line of scrimmage. So outside zone, more aggressive pushing it down the field in the RPO stuff. And I would huddle. I would get under center. Uh, and yeah, I would. Th- there's a time and place for tempo. Uh, I'm a big believer in changing speeds as an offense. But I think sometimes as fast as this team wants to go, I think it limits the way you can attack a defense. And I think Kansas is a perfect example. They change speeds, they huddle, they sugar huddle, they go tempo. They huddle, they sugar huddle, they go tempo. And that what that's what allows you to do all the shifting, motioning, forcing a defense to communicate. And there's just, with how fast the Sooners go on offense, I kind of think you make it easy on defenses sometime from a communication and adjustment standpoint. Now, it's, it's not easy to play that fast as a defense, right? I mean, it taxes you physically, but I think there's, I I think you could tax a defense more mentally by, by changing pace more and and doing some different things. So I I don't know if that answers your question, George, That does, yeah. but those would be the major changes I would implement. It's interesting going into this week, too, with the West Virginia team that has, I think, probably exceeded a lot of people's expectations. I remember being down in uh, Dallas for the Big 12 Media Days. Neil Brown kind of made a bunch of waves because of the way that he was talking about this Mountaineer program that was picked to be, I think, dead last or bottom of the Big 12. Dead last. And so he's done a uh, great job. Neil and I. Go ahead. Neil and I have developed a really good relationship. We, we have him on Big 12 Radio yeah. over on Sirius XM a lot. And he was pissed. <laughs> I mean, pissed. I bet. He, he kept saying, hey, that's lazy. These people don't know what they're talking. Like, he was legitimately pissed. And they have used that as fuel as a program. You go into their facility, and, and you know, I've, I've, become, I've become pretty close to a, a couple guys on that staff. They have 14 plastered everywhere it's all over the facility and it's still there because they were picked 14th in the conference and they have used that 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 disrespect they've used it as fuel and they're playing their best football coming into norman on saturday and they are as confident as they've been all season long guys sure and it, it starts up front, and listening to uh, the Oklahoma breakdown this week with uh, yourself as well as uh, Teddy Lehman, it starts up front for them offensively. I, I know that you've spoke uh, very highly about the Mountaineer offensive line. They may be the best O-line that OU's seen. And now my, my perspective is skewed because they run a lot of outside zone, and it's my favorite play <laughs> in football. I'm going to be the first to admit that. But – We've seen this defensive line for Oklahoma. They haven't played bad. They just haven't had a ton of impact on the game the last two weeks. I mean, Kansas straight up blocked their ass. Yeah. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. And 
Oklahoma State that while they held up well, it was just kind of a stalemate. Right. They they didn't have they didn't play with a bunch of knockback. They had no TFLs as a group again. The defensive line, if they don't play well, this game's gonna be uncomfortable in the fourth quarter. And, and here's why. West Virginia's offensive line has multiple draft picks on their team. I think Zach Frazier, their center, I think he's the best center in all of college football. I watch a lot of center play. It's kind of a, it's it's kind of an obsession, as as you can imagine. It was my position. It's the position I watch most closely. He's fantastic. He he reminds me of Creed Humphrey. That he reminds me of Creed. He's that good. So the interior of that O line, they better come to play, man. They better come to play. And those guys that while they do RPO stuff. A lot of their RPO stuff is kind of based off outside zone action and getting Garrett Green out of the pocket in some of that stuff. This O line flies off the football with velocity. It's fun to watch. And OU's defense, when you when you play with velocity like that as an O line, the gaps change quickly for a defense. So you start thinking about some of the youth and inexperience. At linebacker for Oklahoma, and we'll see what Stutzman, what his status is for the game, but things are going to be happening fast. And and you have to play well. This team, they're the number one rushing offense in the Big 12 when you look at conference stats only. 226 yards per game. C.J. Donaldson is a dude. Jaheim White, 22. He's got wiggle. They got three backs they feel really good about. And the I think one of the keys it's so boring to talk about is first down. If you get them in second and long, you're going to be in good shape. Garrett Green, second and long, and then you end them and then you play well on second down, you end up in third and medium to third and long, and you force Garrett Green to drop back and play quarterback. That's why first down is going to be huge in this football game. If West Virginia is efficient on first down, first of all, this is going to be the shortest game of the year from a time perspective, which I know we don't hate. Yeah, that's not the worst thing. But they are number one by a lot when you look at Big 12 games only in time of possession. Yeah. Nearly 35 minutes. And what did we just see in Bedlam? Uh, Oklahoma State dominated the time of possession. So this is, a, I, I, and maybe I'm just giving them too much credit because I'm blinded by my outside zone love, but Garrett Green, he's fast. Like he can, he can run, run. Oklahoma fans saw and it a year ago. If they can't get off the field, this is going to be a limited possessions game. And the offense, just the last two weeks, they have not been as efficient as they need to be, especially in big moments. So I'm not trying to scare people, but it's this reality. point spread's insane to me. Yeah. I don't know how it's as big as, as it is. Yeah. it's. I mean, what is it, 13 right now? Yeah, is that 13, right? 13. And I half. swear, if it gets to 14, Flight once again, West Virginia's got 14 plastered all over their facility. They break the huddle like at practice with 14. If it gets to 14, there's going to be way too much symbolism there, and I won't like it. Boys. I'm just <laughs> telling you. Uh, Gabe, we, we can't not ask you about OU's offensive line. What are they going up against in West Virginia? And do you feel like it feels – I think last week was the first time in a while – they had just five guys, uh, and it feels like, you know, we've seen that with Bill before where he rotates guys, maybe not this late in a season, but do you feel like they finally have their five up front? I do. Uh, I do. I uh, First and foremost, I, I think Caden Green yeah. is going to be a star at offensive guard. He's got to work on his quickness a little bit. He's got to work on maybe the best word is suddenness. Things happen fast in the interior. If he can do that, the raw power, the attitude, the guy plays with an edge. I And I was trying to decide if this was a good thing or a bad thing. 
he finishes more guys than anyone else on the O-line as a true freshman. It's a great thing for him. I'd love to see the other guys finish blocks the way that he does when when those opportunities are there. You can't just bury guys into the ground every play. Like this is this is real life. But he when he has those opportunities, man, he he finishes with an edge. And I'm I'm really excited about his future. As far as the rest of the group, Tyler Guyton is I mean, he's incredibly talented. Yeah. Uh, he's, and I've said it a lot, his ceiling is a top 10 pick. He's that talented. But it's been a little up and down this year, and I, I have such high expectations for him. I, I'm more critical of him than any other guys because I view him through the lens of this guy can be a top 10 pick. So I don't view him all the same. I don't view Matoyer the same as I view Guyton. But that that's not how I watch the tape, if that makes sense. And he he's still he's got a lot of room to improve with the talent. He needs to be better in the run game. There the, the pad his pad level's got to drop. He needs to be more physical, especially in, in some of the double team stuff. But the the sky is the limit. And I'm interested to see. He's gonna have a tough decision to make. He's gonna have some people telling him that he's gonna get picked in the first round. And when that's happening, it, it's tough to say, no, 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 I'd love to go back to school. Uh, it's just, it's a tough decision. But the other guys, Rouse has been solid. Honestly, he's been better than I thought he was going to be. Yeah. He's been better than I thought he was going to be. Uh, he has, I, I've i been confused as to some of the times where he's been pulled out of games. Uh, and I, I like Jacob Sexton. I think he's going to be, I like his athleticism. He would be awesome in West Virginia's system. <laughs> but he he still he doesn't have the play strength you're looking for uh for your left tackle yet. But it it's gonna come. Uh, I I know it is. But Rouse has been, you know, solid. Has he played like an early round pick or anything like that? I don't think so. But he's been adequate. Uh Rame has been and I hate that so many people are going to remember that snap for sure. Bedlam because he's actually he first of all he played really well in that game, and he's been he's been as good this year uh, he's been better than he's ever been if that makes sense and that's how it should be with him being a veteran guy but I think he's done a better job of leading the group also and and then Matoyer just kind of is what he is he's yeah. a he's a good college football offensive guard. And he's playing banged up, which that dude played on one leg against Kansas. That was that was impressive. It shouldn't need to be that way. Yeah. I I think we'd all agree that Savion Bird's been the kind of the head scratcher of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Where uh, the excitement for what we were gonna see from him was was up there and we just what I've seen is a guy that's completely lost confidence. And it's it's hard to play at a high level if you don't have any confidence, and I think that's affected uh, that that has significantly affected his play, and then he just kind of disappears. I, I mean, literally, just isn't at the game right. for Bedlam. I, I don't, and it's happened multiple times this year where you're going, oh, uh, so I don't, I don't know that that whole thing is strange, but. The O line has been solid. I, I don't think it's been terrible. They have they've done a really good job in pass protection. Uh, the run game mm, needs to be more movement. There's just no doubt about it, especially in the zone stuff. So it, I don't know. I'm kind of torn on the offensive line. There, there's moments where I'm like, yes, that's what it looks like. And then there's moments where I'm like, boys, what are we doing? So the, the level of consistency, especially in the run game, has has not been where I wanted it to be. It, it, it kind of seems like everything else right now within the program, and specifically on the offensive side of the ball, because we, we've talked about the offense, defense, the disparity or the difference in what they have become. It's a stark contrast between what they were over the last four or five years and then this year just Gabe as a whole it feels like this thing's crashing 
right now because they've lost the last two weeks. But I think that at the beginning of the season in August when we were talking about this team, if you would have ripped off a 10-2, and two, I don't know anybody out there that would have said that's a disappointing season, even though it might feel like that right now. Where are you just like kind of big picture as we enter the final three games of Brent Venable's second season in Norman with what is looming uh, ahead and the move that is expected, or not even expected, that is going to come uh, with everything moving down to the SEC in a year? Really, I am... I. I as I get older, I'm trying to be one of those people that like lives in the present, if yeah. that makes sense. Sure. Um, and that's why you, you can't you can't go back and take away the losses. Yeah. I mean, they happen. It's done. It's over. That that's why I'm really interested to see how this team finishes the season. Because last year when it started going bad, I mean, it got got bad. I mean the losses started piling up. <laughs> yeah. And they have a chance in these last 3 weeks and it, and I told this story on, on our podcast but it reminds me a lot of our 2013 season my senior year when we got smoked by Baylor on that Thursday night and all of your goals, right? Playing uh, you know winning a Big 12 title cuz they're winning the championship game then but you know winning a Big 12 title in your senior year, you know possibly being in the picture for a national championship. Like it just, it all went away in one night. And, you know, I gave a little speech after the game to the team where it's like, okay, we have two choices, boys. You know, we can, we can fold and fracture like some bitches or we can man up and finish strong. And that stretch of winning the three last, uh, the, our, our three last regular season games and then going to that sugar bowl and beating Bama, it's, it's one of my favorite stretches in my career. Yeah. And and that Bama game is one of the best nights of my life. <laughs> it's it, and and that's why I love what Stoops said this week. Yeah. yeah I mean, I sure. know everyone's seen Drake that Drake Stoops clip. That's what I'm interested in seeing is how does this team fight? What ha, has the culture that Venables wants taken root? Or do we see this group start to point fingers? Do we see them fracture? That's really what I'm interested in. Sure. Now, I'd love to see them play cleaner football. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt. Stop turning the ball over. <laughs> but that's really what I'm interested in is how, how does it look like? How do these guys stick together? Because they're capable of winning – every game the rest of the way. I mean, there's just, they're going to be favored yeah. every game the rest of the way. It's not even, I mean, it's not even a conversation. Do they go out there and play the way that they need to play to finish strong? And just kind of what's that look like? What's the dynamic of the team? Like, where's the energy level? Where's the effort level? And that's one thing. The execution has not been there. The effort's been there. Though. And that's like the two main categories I look at in football. I mean, everything's – there's a lot to talk about, but do you play with great effort and do you play with great execution? They've played their asses off. They just have not executed at the level they need to execute. So that's – I'm looking for that effort piece to still be there. Like Where are they at on the give a flip meter now that – some of their goals, maybe all of their most significant goals are no longer on the table. I think that tells you a lot about those guys individually, but even more, it tells you about the program, like where it's at right now under Venables. And he said it a lot. He he didn't come here to build a team. He came here to build a program. So uh, that's what I, I'm really interested in seeing what it looks like these last three games. It feels like, too, and I think we're, we're probably out of questions here, Eddie, with, with Gabe, but... It feels like these next three weeks in like a couple of years, we could look back and be like, that was a huge foundation for where this thing is at. Or look back and be like, that was maybe the beginning of the end if this thing goes off the rails uh, for Brent. I don't, I don't know. It feels like these next three weeks, while some fans are like, hey, the season's over, th these next three weeks could, could mean a lot for this program moving forward. I, I completely agree with that. Now, I, I don't know about 
you know, if they don't play well over these next three, does the whole thing fall apart? Right. That's sure, probably yeah. an overreaction. Sure. But I think we all agree that they need to finish this thing strong. Yep. You need to with with the journey that we're all going on next season, you need to finish the season with some moment momentum. Uh, carry that into signing day, carry that onto the recruiting trail and, and carry it into the off season. I'm a believer in that. Uh, I'm a believer kind of in that off season momentum and you throw the bowl game in there, whatever that ends up looking like. But yeah, George, I, I completely agree. These, these next three, the way that it looks, the way that it feels, which may sound strange, but it, it's, it's a big moment for this program, right? The, Ten and two. It ain't what we thought it was going to be after they beat Texas in the Cotton Bowl, but ten and two is still a step in the right direction, uh, especially with some of the things that you know, some of the players that they're bringing in, some of the young players that are playing on this team already, uh, and, and how it sounds. You guys know the recruiting stuff better than I do, but how it sounds like things are going on the recruiting trail. So. You you got to finish strong to carry that momentum so that when people are talking about Oklahoma, they're talking about Oklahoma going, you know, 10 and 2 in year two. Venables are doing, yeah, pretty, pretty solid. Let's yeah. see where it goes from here, as opposed to they they lost four of their last five. Sure. You know, that's that's not a conversation you want. No, it is not. We will see. It all begins on Saturday. He's Gabe Eichard, Sirius XM, Big 12 Today, uh, Oklahoma Broadcast Team, Oklahoma Breakdown Podcast. I think you probably know who Gabe Eichard is if you're watching uh, these two idiots. I'm putting my fingers <laughs> at me and George. But, uh, Gabe. You guys are doing a great job. We appreciate it, I man. I love the content. Thank you. Appreciate Help. it. Hey, Carrie. Carrie, great job pressing the buttons, man. You're awesome. <laughs> I think I hear him yelling from the back. Uh, we appreciate it, Gabe. <laughs> we'll see you on Saturday. All right, boys. Thanks, Gabe. And again, a special thank you to Gabe for joining us. Uh, great podcast that he and Teddy does. Always enjoy catching up with him. Uh, it, you know, it, it's funny, and I, I think we said this on Tuesday, the way that we talk about the Oklahoma football program right now, you would think that they're 1-7. and seven. You really would. Yeah. You would think that this thing is completely off the tracks, and as bad as it has been, uh, you know, you think about back to that 2013 team like Gabe was talking about that really was able to uh, rebound, and then, you know, obviously, kind of, I've always thought, put the pieces in place for what that run was when Lincoln Riley did take over in 2016. And then, so, and then, you know, everybody knows the history there. So uh, they got the work cut out for him. As Gabe said, Oklahoma or uh, West Virginia, very good on the offensive line uh, in a very, very good rushing attack. Yeah. Sixth best in the country, best in the big 12 through big 12 play. Um, you know, a lot of different, you know, running backs, guys that can run a dual threat quarterback, uh, which, you know, has shown to be an issue for Oklahoma at times. So OU's going to have to play really well up front. You think of guys like an Ethan Downs, he's going to have to set the edge, Trace Ford, Rondell Bothroyd, all those guys are going to have to play really well. We'll see what's going on at linebacker, right? Uh, I would expect to see a lot of Kip Lewis again this week, even if Danny Stutzman is healthy because Kip is just playing really good football. I've got a story coming on him on Friday morning, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a really tough matchup. I mean, this is a, a really good uh, offense that Oklahoma's going up against, like Gabe said, they're going to try and control the time and the pace of the game, which can kind of cause OU some problems in terms of playing complementary football. You don't want that defense to be on the field, you know, for 38 minutes like they were sure. last week in Bedlam. So uh, it's a really, really tough test. 12 tackles for loss a year ago in Morgantown. Uh, you add that into the mix of what they weren't able to do last week with zero, as yep. Gabe said. Uh, it presents quite a big challenge for Oklahoma's defensive unit, especially that front seven core, to stop a West Virginia rushing attack led by Garrett Green, a quarterback, as well as C.J. Donaldson and a host of others. Here is Brent Venables and Ethan Downs talking about that task earlier this week. They're physical. Uh, they play with confidence. There's really good co cohesion and chemistry there. Uh, they don't – you just – they work together well, kind of like that marching band. You Like, you know it when you see it, you know it when you don't. They're all – uh, you know, uh, really uh, got good chemistry out there uh, on the field when you watch them. Uh, you know, 
they do a lot of pre-snap communication and, and they just don't turn people loose. They get, do a great job in uh, protecting uh, the passer. Uh, they've only given up nine sacks on the year, which is 11th in the country, uh, second in the conference. And, uh, you know, very few tackles for loss, disruptive type plays. Uh, they just, they don't, there's not a lot of leakage there. They seem very similar to OSU in their scheme. Uh, got, a, got some more QB run game. Uh, very disciplined offense and defense. You know, they've had a lot of games where they come up really close on the score, uh, and they're really talented. You know, they could, any team could beat us, but especially them if they play their good, disciplined ball. Uh, we got to be on top of the uh, on top of how we play, and thank God for another round. Of, like I said, it's a really really similar scheme the OSU did. So getting a uh, second chance at that, you know, get to, get to redeem ourselves a little bit, and uh, to put it on tape and. We don't have to make the game close, you know, really believe in ourselves, offense, defense, special teams, triple braided cord is what we call it, and really applying it on game day. That's what we're looking forward to. Triple braided cord. That's a uh, Oklahoma catchphrase that I don't think we've heard yet. I've never uh, heard in that. the In the first couple of years of Brent Vittables. Uh, so I'm sure that they got their work cut out for them. All right. Let's talk about uh, kind of the elephant in the room. Oklahoma offensively, uh, you dug into the numbers. It's something that we've talked about on the Eskridge Lexus postgame show on Saturday. Uh, the now infamous Eskridge Lexus postgame show uh, live from Stillwater as we were. And uh, we talked about it this week on the unofficial 40. Uh, it's been talked about on the Crimson Corner as well uh, on Soonerscoop.com. Oklahoma offensively is extremely hard to figure out right now because of the total package and what it looks like it looks good but then you get into critical spots and as you looked at it hasn't been very good yeah I mean it, it feels like every time we watch them it's you know in the second half you see them kind of crumble in spots they can go and extend the lead or, or get the get, get the lead back so I went back and I looked through every game OU has had 29 offensive possessions in the second half this year where they're either leading or trailing by one score. On 19 of those 29 possessions, OU either punted or turned the ball over. On 15 of those 19 possessions, it was on five plays or less that they had the football. So you're talking about really quick possessions where they're failing to put the game away or take the lead back. Uh, they also had 45 possessions this year in which they led by seven points or more. They scored on 24 of those, uh, but the note there is 18 of those 24 uh, came against Arkansas State and Tulsa. So when you talk about Big 12 play, extending leads, regaining control of a game offensively, Oklahoma has failed to do it in, in some of the most critical spots this season. I, and I know, you know, the eye test says that, but to go back and find those numbers, I thought it was really interesting. And, and you know, going through it, and you can see this on Scoop, I, I also tweeted out the graph of it, but those 19 possessions, Eddie, it's a it's a whole host of things. Whether it's uh, you know a, a bad play call, maybe you know there's a couple Gavin Freeman jet sweeps there on third and short. Uh, you know it's a DG bad interception, right? Uh, a fumbled snap, those sorts of things. It's it's so many different things. Penalties. There were sure. several penalties on that list. It's not just one thing. I think everybody wants to say, well, it's on you know offensive coordinator Jeff Lebby, which. At the end of the day, the coaches, you know, they're the ones to blame in a lot of ways for things because, they, I mean, they're at the front of this thing. But uh, at the same time, it's it's an execution thing. I know Gabe talked about that too. Uh, it doesn't seem like the offense is executing in those moments. So it falls on everybody, and it's not just – it's not saying, oh, well, you know, it's the run game. That's not that's that's not what the issue is. It's it's a whole bunch of things, and I think that that's maybe the frustrating part is it's it's so many different things that are also very avoidable and very correctable yeah as well and that was kind of a theme that you talked about uh with the players on monday night it's a theme that has been throughout this two-game losing streak for oklahoma is a lot of these mistakes that they're making are correctable here's dylan gabriel and some of his offensive teammates talking about just that yeah i do i think they're all correctable mistakes you know and things that you know we just let slip you know and, and like I said, we took our turns and, and, you know, whatever mistakes we did make. And I'm not saying we got to play perfect because that's, you know, not a, a way to play as well. It's just, you know, it all adds up. So you got to be really detailed, um, try to take advantage of every opportunity when, when it's presented and, um, you know, score and get ahead while you can, you know. Talk about winning the fourth quarter, but, you know, it can help if you win the first and second and even the third. So just finding ways to win early, start fast and finish strong. Uh, really, there's a lot of little things. I mean, you could pick out 
10 to 15 plays on offense that could, I mean, you change that play and it completely changes the whole game. And just the timeliness, timeliness has a really big effect. And Coach Mendel mentioned that today, we meeting with the, some of the seniors. Just the, the timeliness of some of our turnovers has really not beneficial for us. And like that, I alluded to that on Saturday when I talked to you guys about how playing complimentary football is important if you want to win, win big football games against good opponents. And, you know, defense gets a turnover and then we go three and out. Or we score a touchdown and they give up a long 75 yard touchdown. I mean, it's just not complimenting each other. And the timeliness of the mistakes were, it was crucial and it, and it hurt us in a bad way. I think it's both. I mean, when you watch the tape from a game and you see just how close you are to just breaking something, instead of a four yard run, you could have had a 30 or break it for 60. I mean, those things are awful to watch because that's what we practice Monday through Friday to make sure we get down on Saturdays. But on the other hand, yeah. It is a little reassuring because we're not far. We're, we're so close. It's literally 12 inches here, um, just six inches tighter off the guard here. I mean, it's so close, but it goes both ways. Kind of tough to stomach. I think that uh, there is one thing that Oklahoma needs to do this weekend, and that is go win a football game. Get some good vibes going. Uh, as we talked about with Gabe, you know, as, as much as people probably don't want to hear it, as much as I probably don't want to sit here and tell and, and say it out loud to you all. Uh, you know, getting to 10 wins, I think, should be the new kind of main goal, number one, for Oklahoma. And we'll see where that gets you. Will that get you to Arlington? You're going to need some help. Uh, you want to be Texas Tech fans this week. You probably want to be Central Florida fans. And you for sure want to be Horned Frog fans as uh, you look at kind of the landscape of what yeah. the Big 12 is. And Oklahoma's going to need some help. Uh, the one positive that has probably been lost in uh, in what has been a hellacious two weeks for Oklahoma football. It does seem like they've been able to run the ball a little bit. And you had the 55 for uh, 269 in Lawrence, as well as 27 for 148 a year ago. West Virginia, historically, uh, and specifically with within uh, games against Oklahoma, Oklahoma's been able to find a way to run the ball. Uh, they've usually been able to find a way to score points as well, averaging 42 points a game in those 10 meetings. Uh, and then last year, you had Eric Gray going for 211. Yeah, I, I think they rank 57th in rushing defense this year. So kind of average. Uh, I think Oklahoma should be able to run the football. And like you said, the last two weeks, they've been able to bust off some big runs, whether it's Tawi Walker and Lawrence. I thought Gavin Sawchuk was exceptional in Stillwater. I feel like he needs to kind of be their go-to guy, especially if Tawi is still a little bit banged up. We'll see. Maybe we'll see. Dalen Smothers out there. Uh, I wonder if he's starting to get some more reps, especially if Tawi's hurt. And I don't know what's going on with Javante Barnes. I don't think anybody does. But I, that is the one silver lining with the offense. It does seem to be coming together. You also talk about the offensive line. I mentioned it to Gabe. They already have five. You know, it sounds like they have their five going forward. I know it's it's. there's only three games left, and they finally have their five. But that is worth uh, something going forward. So hopefully they can find something. But like you said, Eddie, they got to go in this week, man. Uh, I think everybody would feel better. Uh, maybe there won't be any F-bombs on the post-game podcast if but, they go in. And if there are, it'll be more of a celebratory thing. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> Sometimes the F-word can be used to celebrate. That's true. That's true. Uh, but but you're right. I, I just This week is, is big because I, I do think that West Virginia is probably the best team left on their schedule. Not to say that BYU or TCU couldn't beat Oklahoma. I think anybody could beat Oklahoma right now the way they're playing. But... West Virginia has been playing really good football. They feel confident in the way that they're playing. You look at BYU, they've kind of had a rough stretch of games, and then TCU has just been up and down all year. So, And like you said, anything can happen. So anybody out there saying uh, they don't have anything left to play for, you go win these three games, see where the dust settles, maybe somebody loses and you somehow sneak your way into Arlington and you get another shot at one of these teams that beat you. Uh, that, that is a very real possibility. And if not, you get to go to a New York Six Bowl which I think is also really valuable. And you talk about the growth of the program. Uh, year two under Brent Venables, if they can get to 10, maybe even 11 wins, um, yeah, that would be, I think, a huge step in the right direction. No doubt about it. We will be back on Saturday late night with the 6 o'clock kickoff for the Eskridge Lexus postgame show alongside Kerry Burdock. And then uh, we will be back right here next week on Monday with the uh, recruiting wrap-up with uh, Josh McQuestion and, uh, you know, a BYU week, a little bit of a... Uh, Provo. Untraveled uh, waters, if you will. Never been to Utah. Unnavigated waters. Haven't been to Utah either. Yeah, should be fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope we get a little bit of a snow game. It'd be kind of fun. I, I don't think we are. The early projection is quite cool. 
with uh, some rain showers in the a.m. Oh, on like Saturday. That. So we'll see what time the kickoff is. Yeah, we should probably be, be 10 p.m. We should be, uh, yeah, back here, yeah. 8 o'clock out there. Uh, we should be getting that as Oklahoma BYU has been put on the Big 12 six-day window. I don't know. Maybe they just canceled the game because it seems like that's what Big 12 thinks about Oklahoma these days. So we shall see. Uh, it should be an interesting one coming up Saturday, 6 o'clock, OU West Virginia. George and I will talk to you on the other side for the instant reaction Saturday night right here on the Soonerscoop.com YouTube channel.